Hello, I welcome you all to today's session where we are going to discuss the next part of the structure of proteins. We have also discussed previously the type of amino acids, their categories, their classifications, their functions. So the next part is how amino acids join to make the proteins. The biological function of a protein is mostly due to its conformation and the conformation is also defined as its three dimensional structure. You must be understanding by then that the three dimensional arrangement of atoms of a molecule are most important for a particular biological structure to be active. The four basic structural levels that are present in the proteins, they are as follows. That can be the primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure. So, let us discuss the primary structure of protein in detail. The primary structure of a protein essentially refers to the number and the linear sequence of amino acids. Suppose this is amino acid 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, so on. So every of this uh, darkened circle that I have represented they say for example represent one one amino acid so when they are arranged in this linear chain like fashion then it is their primary structure and it also shows you the presence of disulfide bridges if that sulfur containing amino acid cysteine or something like that present then they must be interlinked with each other with disulfide bridges so their location is also marked by the primary structure each protein has a unique sequence of amino acids as I have already told you and that is determined by the genes which are present on DNA. The primary structure of a protein is largely responsible for what kind of biological function it performs. A vast majority of genetic diseases you will find that it is due to the abnormality of the amino acid sequence of the proteins. That is if the primary structure of the protein changes then you will find the defect. Remember when I was teaching you blood vascular system, I had told you about sickle cell anemia. It is a condition where the normal biconcave or disc shaped RBC that changes into the sickle shape and because it changes into the sickle shape, then the ox um, you will find that that clots or clogs and it undergoes auto degeneration and it leads to serious health consequences. Particularly, sickle cell anemia is a disorder in which the RBCs become sickle cell under the conditions of oxygen deficiency. Like if you go to higher altitudes or if you are performing strenuous physical exercise, then this condition can be marked. The disorder of the, or the condition is caused by the formation of an abnormal hemoglobin that is called as hemoglobin S, means hemoglobin sickle cell. So this hemoglobin S differs from the normal hemoglobin which we can write as hemoglobin A only in position of one amino acid in the beta chain of the amino acid. So in normal conditions glutamic acid is present in the sixth position of the globin chain and due to this uh, abnormal replacement when in sixth position valine is there that means glutamic acid will be present in the sixth position of this normal amino acid. When this glutamic acid will be substituted by valine amino acid, then only this change remaining other places remaining the constant, you will find that sickle cell RBCs will be generated. Due to the sickle shaped condition of the RBC, oxygen binding capacity of RBC is greatly reduced and that creates that oxygen deficiency condition for the cells of the body. And you will also find that the sickle shaped RBCs because of their shape they cannot pass through the narrow blood capillaries and as a result they have a tendency to clot among the, themselves and finally they will degenerate and sometimes they choke the blood capillaries. 
and they block the blood circulation and oxygen supply to different parts of the body is seriously disturbed and in long term it will affect your spleen and brain which can get damaged and if you ask the patient he, will, he or she will com complain of acute physical weakness shortness of breath and particularly if you are homozygous that is hbs hbs in condition then such patients usually they die before reaching the teenage because the erythrocyte is so much distorted that it automatically undergoes degeneration so now coming back to the primary structure you will find that always there is a n terminal end that means this last amino acid will be having its amino group free where you can attach further amino acids and this is called as the c terminus and the last amino acid that is present over here it will be having its carboxylic acid group free so that you can attach more amino acids if you want so n terminal amino acid as you have seen it will be always written towards the left side of the polypeptide chain and the c terminal will be given at the right hand of the chain the primary structure is thus a complete description of the covalent connections of protein in 1953 actually the scientist frederick sanger he had elucidated this primary structure for the protein hormone insulin we have studied function of insulin in our system so insulin consists of two polypeptide chains one is 21 amino acids long another is 30 amino acids long and how they are linearly arranged this was elucidated by frederick sanger and from there we could come to know about the primary structure of the proteins the proteins with different activities can vary differently in their primary structure because this is basically the structure which is responsible for assigning the specific functions to proteins hemoglobin from different species of animals for example it might have similar sequences like in monkeys and in us it might be almost the same except for few residues and it carries the same function that is of oxygen and carbon dioxide transport so now let us come to the secondary structure of proteins The secondary structure is essentially the folding of a linear polypeptide chain into a specific coiled structure and such coiling or folding is produced or maintained by the hydrogen bonds and this folding is important because the amino acid residues which otherwise are present very far apart from, from each other in their primary structures in this folding they are brought together in close proximity and that leads or enhances their biological activity so there are basically three types of secondary structures one is called as the alpha helix otherwise the other one is otherwise called as the beta pleated sheet and the third one is called as a collagen helix it is a specific helix that we will discuss further so now let us come to the structure of the alpha helix how does it look like and what are its structural peculiarities this chain is coiled spirally that means it will be a right handed spiral coiling like this and it is generally uh, stabilized by the hydrogen bonds which are present between the please remember this they will be for stabilized by the hydrogen bonds which will be present between the carboxylic acid group of one amino acid and the amino group of the next amino acid which is present at four distances away suppose here is the first position of the amino acid and here is the fourth position so here the carboxylic acid group and the amino group they will be joined together by this hydrogen bond so this weak hydrogen bonds stabilize the structure further the alpha helical coil is found in several proteins that it is found in the keratin that is present in your hair that gives that shininess and the suppleness to your hair it is also present in muscle proteins like troponin myosin etc they have this right handed helical form it is also present in the fibrin i think you remember fibrin that is present in the blood clot 
so alpha helix is the most common spiral structure of the protein as we have discussed the alpha structure was proposed by two scientists one's name was pauling and another's name was cory cory's name you have heard in muscle contraction so they were regarded as one of the most important milestones in the biochemical research now having said and learnt this let us understand ki what are the main you can say features of a alpha helix the first thing is that it is a tightly packed structure and the amino acid side chains they can extend outwards from the central axis second it is stabilized by hydrogen bonds as i have told between the first amino acids carboxylic acid group and the fourth amino acids amino group so it is the hydrogen bonds which are individually weak but collectively when you speak they form quite a strong structure and stabilize the helix the third structure is that all the peptide bonds except the first and the last they can participate in the formation of the helix starting from the second to last part one all can participate in the hydrogen bond formation and each turn of the helix that means from here to completely here this place and this place are just above to each other from starting from here again this place are just above each other so this is called as a complete turn of the helix so the complete turn of the helix that will be having on an average 3.6 amino acid residues and the complete turn of the helix will be having a length of 0.54 nanometers so on an average two amino acids if you divide this 0.54 nanometer by 3.54 it will be coming roughly around 1. Point, sorry 0.15 nanometers between two amino acids that means in this alpha helix two consecutive amino acids are placed from apart from each other at 0.15 nanometer distance alpha helix is a, a stable conformation and it is with lowest energy that is why quite stable the right handed alpha helix is more stable than the left handed helix in some cases you will also find left handed helix of proteins are there but that is rare to find certain amino acids particularly like proline they disrupt the alpha helix formation means if there will be too much proline residues in the amino acid sequence of the proteins then you cannot basically make it into an alpha helix it is because the large number of acidic or basic amino acids interfere with the formation of the alpha helix structure now having said this let us move over to the second one that is the beta pleated sheet now let us understand how does this look like a beta pleated sheet is a secondary structure where two or more polypeptide chains they inter get interconnected by the hydrogen bonds and the sheet is produced instead of a fiber in alpha helix we were getting a rod or a you can say straight structure but here you will get a sheet and how does it look like exactly like this the most important and common example is that of the silk protein or fibroin ever you have seen i am not talking about the art silk or the artificial silk i am talking about the real silk which is produced by bombax mori or the silk worm so in this case you will find that in a real silk you will be once you will be moving then the fabric shines automatically so these are the sheets which move over or slide over each other it is interconnected to each other in this way so once it is held in this particular form once you move then this sheets they slide over each other making the structure sign i can think you understand what i am trying to mean so the adjacent strands of the polypeptides in this case you will find they may run in the same direction if they are 
running in the same direction then it is called as a parallel beta pleated sheet so this is a parallel sheet and this is found in case of your hair protein that is keratin hairs also once you keep open then they shine it is because of this and in opposite direction so if this helix runs in this direction this is in this and this is in this then that will be the silk protein or fibroin so in silk protein or in fibroin it is an anti parallel beta pleated sheet and in the hair protein or keratin it is the parallel beta sheet now let us come to the collagen helix that is the third type of configuration of the secondary structure of proteins actually the collagen helix is a helix which is having three strands like one strand will be like this the second strand will be like this and the third strand will be running like this and they will be held by this weak forces of attraction like this so in case of this particular structure of collagen helix you will find that particularly it is also called as tropo collagen helix and there are three polypeptide chains which are coiled around one another the coil is strengthened by the establishment of these dotted lines which are the hydrogen bonds that i have shown in green color dots and they are formed between the amino group of particularly the amino acid glycine which is present in any strand and the carboxylic group of any other amino acid that is present in other strands so wherever glycine will be present at those areas we will find this bond formation of hydrogen there are also a locking effect with the help of proline and hydroxyproline residues then let us come to the tertiary structure of proteins so the tertiary structure of protein is the bending or folding in the form of a sphere either it will be present like this it will be present like this or it will be present like a rod so generally it is a bending or folding which can form sphere rod or fibers and it further stabilizes and uh, you can say it brings new steric relationships of amino acid particularly which are otherwise present far apart from each other in the linear sequence the active sites particularly of that polar side chains of one protein are often but close towards the surface means if it is a globular structure the polar side chains will be projecting on the surface and the hydrophobic areas will be present in the core of that globular protein tertiary structure is stabilized by several types of bonds the first one is that of a hydrogen bond as already i have told you the hydrogen bond are developing due to the sharing of proton or hydrogen atoms by two electronegative atoms it is a weak bond but as a if it is present too frequently the total effect makes it a considerable strengthened bond and it leads to the molecular stability as we have studied in case of the alpha helix then the second one is that of the ionic bond or ionic or electrostatic interactions this one is mainly due to the protons so electrostatic bonds they occur due to the attractive force between two oppositely charged groups already i have told that in jupiter and form this group is protonated and this group is deprotonated so if they are brought close together in an aqueous environment this bond is much weaker than a covalent bond and can be broken by changing the ph of the medium you know what i am talking about when you add lemon to milk or vinegar to milk then milk curdles no that is to form paneer at your home so it is because the ionic bonds which are present in the milk protein casein they are broken and the protein casein is no longer soluble in the base of milk so that is why milk curdles so curdling of the milk is based on the fact that covalent bond can be broken by changing the ph of uh, this uh, solution or medium now let us come to exactly what are covalent bonds
in protein structure the covalent bonds are considered to be the strongest and they can be of two types as the peptide bonds that i have already told you in the previous session which is formed between two successive amino acid residues and another is this disulfide bridges that is this s and s bonds so the peptide bond already you know it is formed when a water molecule is eliminated during a reaction between two successive amino acids and one amino acid contributes its amino group and another its carboxylic group the disulfide bond can be formed between different chains of amino acids or between different parts of the same chain if it is formed in between the different parts of the same chain then it makes the molecule fold into a particular shape they are quite strong bonds and are, cannot be easily broken they give uh, some degree of rigidity uh, to you can say to the protein structure they are comparatively more stable if you compare them with the ionic or electrostatic bonds and hydrogen bonds in comparison to them they are quite stable and uh, generally it will be formed by, uh, between the sulfur containing amino acids like that of cysteine then let us come to the hydrophobic bonds so hydrophobic bonds are formed between two non polar groups remember this they are always formed between two non polar groups and it helps to you can say exclude or remove water in that area and it helps to compact the protein or to make the protein more compact then last one is the Vanderwaals force of attraction. This already you know. It can develop with charge fluctuations between two closely placed groups like CH two OH, CH two OH. If they are present close together, having charge fluctuations, then they can develop this one. now coming to the quaternary structure of proteins that is the last level of structure the proteins are said to have this quaternary structure if they are having minimum two or more polypeptide chains and they should be united by forces other than the covalent bonds like you cannot have a peptide and disulfide bond between them and you can say that it is going towards the quaternary structure no the forces that stabilize these aggregates are definitely the hydrogen bonds and the electrostatic bonds which are formed between the amino acids on the polypeptide chains particularly hemoglobin it is an excellent example of this quaternary structure it is consisting of two alpha helix like this two beta helix are present over like this forming the total structure right having said this now let us come to what are the properties of proteins so the first property is their solubility proteins uh, which form colloidal solutions instead of true solutions in water and it is because of their huge size second already i have told their molecular weight generally you will find proteins they vary in their molecular weight and that is dependent on um, how many number of amino acids they are having majority of proteins can be consisting of around 40 to 4000 amino acids and the molecular weight can vary between 4000 to 44000 daltons proteins with their molecular weights like insulin is having a weight of 5700 hemoglobin 64500 etc the third one is their shape so that is a wide variation already we have studied some may be globular like insulin that appears globular albumin the egg protein appears oval fibrinogen the clot protein appears elongated then fourth one is their amphoteric nature this already i have discussed with you when i was talking about the jitter ions in aqueous medium a protein has both cationic and anionic groups there are several of such groups on the same molecule so the chemical like a protein carrying both the positive and negative charges is said to be amphoteric or uh, having both cation and anionic properties 
Isolation of cationic or anionic group depends on the pH of the medium. At a specific pH, the protein can be electrically neutral because the number of positive charges and the number of negative charges, they exactly balance each other. At this point where the positive and the negative charges balance each other, that is called as the isoelectric point. The next one is their reactivity. Next property of proteins is their reactivity due to the intra chain or inter chain in between the chain or between two successive chain bonding or folding a protein is said to have a particular surface configuration and this specificity provides functional diversity to proteins remember the enzymes are having uh, specific active sites they can bind to a particular uh, substrate so it is because if you have a particular shaped active site there you can hold a particular substrate like if this is a protein and this is the active site obviously the shape of the active site tells you that if the substrate will be of this shape then it can fit into this i cannot make this shape of substrate or this shape of substrate to go into the active site of this so that is determined by their inter and intra chain folding Antibodies particularly also are glycoproteins which specific pathogens ko attach kar sakte and their toxins ko immobilize kar sakte because of their specificity or their reactivity. Then next is their permeation. Certain cell membranes you know that they don't allow movement of certain proteins. And uh, you can say that inward and outward movement through exocytosis and endocytosis can occur. Generally, the cells uh, synthesize their own proteins and these aquaporins and others, they help the cell to move substances that are soluble in water. Their next last property is their property of denaturation or renaturation. Extreme changes in the temperature or pH that can disrupt the bonds to maintain the tertiary structure of the protein and that leads to the loss of the functional activity of proteins and that is called as denaturation. So it is simply a state where the tertiary structure is destroyed due to the presence of either uh, you can say how uh, 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 due to heat or uh, due to chemicals, due to alkalis etc. So that is why you will find that this extreme changes, uh, this is the reason why no organism can survive above a temperature of 45 to 55 degrees Celsius because higher temperature also denatures protein. A denatured protein may be spontaneously refolded into its original structure. If it can come back to its original structure, it is called as renaturation. And uh, let us discuss some of the agents. The physical agents which can break the tertiary structure of the protein can be heat as I, I said you if you shake them too violently then if x-rays or UV radiations are focused on proteins they can break the bonds present in the tertiary structure and denature it. Chemical agents already I told acids, alkalis, solvents um, particularly of organic origin like that of ether, alcohol etc. Salts of heavy metals, urea, salicyclate they can disrupt the structure of the proteins. Now let us come to the last part that is called as coagulation of proteins. So generally the term coagulum refers to a semi-solid viscous precipitate of a protein. Irreversible denaturation results in coagulation means once coagulation of a protein occurs you cannot renature it. Coagulation is optimum and it requires lowest temperature at the isoelectric pH. Albumin, globulin are coagulable proteins. Heat coagulation is commonly used to detect the presence of albumin in urine. So having said this, we come to the end of this series of discussions where we have discussed the different type of proteins, their different structures, their primary linear structure, their secondary structure, their tertiary structure, the forces that were holding those structures together and the quaternary structure and how they are important biologically for proteins. Thank you.